Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It was amazing. Great, thanks. Um, this might be a bit of a controversial question in the world of psychiatry, especially now. Um, but are you familiar with the use of um, uh, ancient kind of psychotropic substances such as iboga and ayahuasca and uh, what you think about those and if they're possible uh, for treating addiction? Um, yeah, I, I am somewhat familiar with that. And there's been a new wave of research into using psychedelics for treatment of anxiety, depression, PTSD, and addiction. Um, and uh, I think it's great, <laughs> I mean, in a nutshell. I, I think that psychedelics are in a very different category than drugs like heroin and methamphetamine for most people. Uh, for most people, they can be uh, very helpful for all kinds of issues of self-actualization, getting a better sense of yourself in the world. Of course, for some people, they're not nice, and some people have to just avoid them. But in general, I think, you know, they have this tremendous capacity for changing one's perspective in a pretty radical way, which might take a long time through psychotherapy. So I, I think it's very uh, promising. Yeah. Um, there's two up the back there and, and one man down here. So you have to start on that. Yeah, in, in thinking about all the different things that one become, can become addicted to, is it the case that there's differences between them in terms of the level of addictiveness? And if that is the case, do we know why? Uh, a level of addictedness uh, or addictiveness. Addictiveness, the difficulty to kick. Yeah. Well, I mean, those, the statistics about uh, the uh, time frame from starting to ending is helpful in that respect. So presumably, it's a lot easier to kick cocaine than it is to, to kick nicotine. Because the median uh, you know, duration uh, is four years rather than 25 years. So that tells us a lot. But I would say that those medians are, uh, those, uh, those are like means or averages, but the median, median slightly different mathematically, uh, are, uh, they're a little bit misleading because that implies that there's some bell-shaped curve, and it's not like that. There could be a very, you know, very messy curve. It could be bimodal. So some people might quit much sooner and some people might take longer. And I think that then leads us to think really in terms of individual differences and how important it is to think about the, the synchronization between the person and the substance. So you know, some people don't like heroin at all. <laughs> and for some people, it's fantastic. You know, it's the same with methamphetamine and coke. Some people really like it, some people hate it. Uh, and these individual um, uh, considerations, these individual attractions, are really interesting to me because they, they come from the personality, they come from our upbringing. What do you feel you're missing? Are you missing, you know, the sense of connectedness and love? Or do you feel like you're missing a sense of power and awakeness and, you know, uh, uh, dynamism? That will determine what you're attracted to, and the degrees will determine how much you're attracted to those things. Does that, does that help? There's another question up there, yeah. Yes, I have a, um, a, a friend who um, months and months and months can go by and then suddenly starts again. And what it makes me think, is that craving or is that results of the stress at, at long term involved in high level jobs and whatever you, the stress in the end, they can't stand it anymore. And this is a way out of the um, stress. Um, yeah, there, there's a, both. There's, there's a phenomenon called incubation of craving, which means that craving can increase during say the first six months or so of abstinence. Uh, so, it might be easier to avoid going back to it in the first two or three weeks when it's still very fresh how nasty it was and how it's fucking up your life. Um, am I allowed to swear? <laughs> uh, um, but, but uh, and then, you know, three or four or five months later when those negative memories are more dim, you might be more tempted to say, well, you know, uh, maybe on weekends it's okay. And then you fall back into it. But that certainly interacts with, with stresses. And um, the, uh, uh, um, it, any, any kind of perturbing negative experience which induces anxiety or depression, losing a job, losing a, a marriage, losing whatever, getting a parking ticket, God, in the Netherlands, parking tickets are like 100 euros sometimes. <laughs> Could almost, you know, send me back into being an addict. <clears throat> so, 
So I think, I think that both are really important. And, and it does manifest as craving because the stress start, makes you start thinking about, you know, I'd really like to just calm down, just like to let's deal with this. And I know that if I had a drink, I'd really feel better. And it's like, so then the craving starts up. So that's, that's the way in which they're interconnected, I think. Do you have your hand up or are you not yeah. asking? Yes, I saw this one next. But. Yeah, um, a relative of mine about a year ago had the TMS treatment you talked about before, but that was actually for depression. So just interested in your comments about the, the comparison between addiction and depression in that regard. You're talking about TMS treatment for depression? Yeah. Yeah, I've heard about that. Uh, they are starting to use it clinically for depression and also for, for OCD. Um, so do you mean TMS or do you mean deep brain stimulation? You mean TMS? Trans yeah. Magnetic, yeah. magnetic stimulation. Okay. I don't really know much about it, to tell you the truth. I mean, I don't know how well it's been studied and how well it's been validated and what sort of success rates they have. But I guess the good thing to, to remember is that TMS can turn regions off, but it can also turn regions on. It can stimulate activation in cortical regions, or it can uh, uh, yeah, uh, disrupt activation in cortical regions, depending on the frequency of the pulse and stuff like that. And I really don't know much about it. There's a lady here, and then there's a lady up at the back somewhere. Yes, down here. Um, thank you very much for laying out the um, learning mechanisms that are um, so dominant in <coughs> addictions. Mm -hmm. um, I, just to be sort of controversial, I'm still not quite sure why you're so reluctant to call it a disease. Um, except for psychosocial reasons, that it makes the person feel disempowered. I mean, that you describe the brain mechanisms behind it, and um, it has. It is the case, isn't it, that not everybody uh, confronted with um, the possibility of becoming addicted becomes addicted. And I. So what comes addicted? Not every person uh -huh. who has the, <clears throat> the opportunity to become addicted right. becomes addicted. Yes. And I was thinking of earlier work, I don't know if it's still thought of as valid, with primates where <clears throat> um, they were <clears throat> given the opportunity to um, drink, I think, opium-laden mm -hmm. fluids. Mm -hmm. And some drank and became addicted mm -hmm. and others didn't and wouldn't unless it, and didn't become addicted mm -hmm. unless mm -hmm. they were forced to drink. Mm -hmm. And um, following up the dry period, some after a period of um, sort of desperate illness, um, some of them stopped drinking for months mm -hmm. and then, as it appeared, um, fell by the wayside again. So I'm just trying to think that there must be perhaps brain mechanisms and individual differences, which mm -hmm. Um, a part yeah. of these responsible. Yeah, there are, sure, there are individual differences. In the, why wouldn't that allow one to call it? Because disease? biological differences in the brain don't make something a disease. Brain differences uh, can predict a school performance, can predict the likelihood of a successful marriage, can predict you know the likelihood of, of making a certain amount of money. Brain differences, the intelligence, the cognitive style, I mean, all of these have to do with brain differences. But you've, you've, you've touched on two important points. One is the genetic factor, and the other is the environmental factor. And the genetics of addiction, yes, there are genetic predictors, but you, you get sold a real bill of goods when people say that addiction is 50% genetic, because that implies that there is an addictive personality, and there isn't. If you look at the behavioral genetics, you look at the data, some people who have impulsive personality styles, who are risk takers, more or less, kind of like me. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I apparently climbed up on, uh, you know, climbed things whenever I could. Um, uh, and um, so that increases the propensity, the likelihood of addiction, because you're more likely to try stuff. You're also more likely to try bungee jumping and skydiving and unsafe sex. So you get some of the variants from that. Other people who are anxious or are depressive, uh, that may have to do with rejection sensitivity, which can be biological, it can be partly, um, partly inborn, partly genetically linked. They also are more 
more prone to addiction. So you've got two opposite personality styles, both of which increase the odds of becoming addicted. So instead of any personality, just addiction personality, you've got all these little variables, and that's how behavioral genetics works. They just pool all this stuff together. You're probably also more likely to become addicted if you're really ugly or, <laughs> or something, you know, or, or, or if your feet smell. Um, like, because the, these things matter. Everything's biological. And, and, and um, uh, the, the way that your body is shaped by, your inher by inherited characteristics is important. What's also important is the way you interact with your social environment. So when you talk about that primate research, there's also research with primates showing that um, the monkeys who are put in a lower position on the dominance hierarchy, this is fairly recent stuff, I don't remember the exact details, but if they're in the presence of a more dominant male, they are more likely to drink. And the dominant male is less likely to drink. Why? Because the dominant male is having a good time and the subdominant male isn't. So these, these are strong social environmental factors that also affect the propensity towards addiction. So the genetics, the environment, the, the, you know, the social context, and also there's all these societal variables, including poverty, uh, uh, um, the, you know, the, uh, um, some, some of the racism, uh, um, the particular problems that people have to resolve because of their class or their color or their parentage. These are all problems that will predict the likelihood of addiction. Okay. There's a lady up there at the back, but she, she, I can't see where she was now, who put her hand up. Oh, and we've got several at the top. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go to... Can, can we get, there were some people over here who wanted to ask questions. Could we go there first? Oh, oh right, OK, sorry. <laughs> I'm um, sorry, it wasn't, it was a Thanks man. very much sorry, for your talk. Great talk. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the key role of dopamine in the brain. Yeah. Now, this is a slightly specialist question. Um, would you be able to say anything about drugs that block dopamine and how that might affect the, the picture in terms of learning, in terms of goal-seeking mm -hmm. behavior, in terms of just generally functioning? They've, they've, there has explain. This, is, this is John Mason, who's a colleague of mine. He's a psychiatrist. And uh -huh. <laughs> you know, do you want to take, know, do you want to take no, this no, question? No, 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 I don't. I want to no, hear I what you've got to maybe say. You should. But, but it's a shared, it, we have a shared concern about the effects of antipsychotic drugs right. which block and reduce right. dopamine right. functioning. So it would be interesting well, to hear what you Well, I believe that from your article that I read this yeah. morning. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so most of the dopamine blocking drugs are, are antipsychotics. And there are. Um, as you know, they, they uh, have all kinds of nasty side effects, like, a, like flat affect changes in body size, overeating. Uh, they dull motivation and, and so on and so forth. And they can, uh, you know the list way better than I do. I don't think they've been able to find drugs that can specifically block the dopamine receptors that are specialized for uh, the D1 and D2 receptors, which, and D3 um, in the striatum, which are most involved in the um, mesolimbic dopamine system, right? The, the dopamine system that's involved with motivation rather than the motor dopamine system. And, and because you can't find a specialized dopamine blocker, you have these, these things that block dopamine at a global level, which just you know, flatten motivation and, and, and uh, emotion in a much too general a way. That's my sense of it. So there were some questions up there on the... Yes, there are two, two men there. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, I just okay. wanted a, que a question about unintended consequences. So you're talking very much about the brain, individual brains, and, uh, and the sub-brain level about how all this stuff works. If you were to go up to the societal level, yeah. um, I'm thinking of an example like in Australia where they're effectively banning cigarette smoking through lawful means. Is there anything that can be learned from that? And do you think there might be bigger consequences that... that that, that, that you might be suppressing addictive um, outcomes mm -hmm. on, on, a, on a very large scale by those sort of uh, lawful interventions. And maybe that's outside your field, but... Like, like those who have what? What was the last bit? Um, the lawful interventions which are trying to stop this addictive behaviour. It's, it's, it's not addressing any of the stuff you've talked about, but right, could it I be see. unintended consequences? 
you know, I mean, I kind of follow Johan Hari, a British journalist who wrote a book called the, uh, Chasing the Scream, The First and Last Days of the War on Drugs. The War on Drugs has been this massive program and, and policy uh, um, that has been uh, disseminated by Western governments, particularly by the US, to suppress and block the availability of drugs that we don't want people to take. And it was originally, you know, kind of like, uh, well, particularly targeted toward uh, cocaine and heroin. It had strong racist uh, characteristics because we didn't like the way black people took cocaine and heroin. And even now in the US, blacks are much more likely to land in prison for cocaine related offenses, including just using cocaine, than our white people. But the overall, the overall outcome of the war on drugs has been disastrous. You try to suppress drugs, you try to suppress drug availability, and what happens is you're handing it over to criminal elements. So you get these massive empires of these drug cartels that have really overtaken uh, well, Mexico for sure, and a lot of the rest of Central and South America. They're incredibly powerful because if people want a particular commodity and it gets blocked at one point, it gets, it gets uh, made available by another point, supply and demand. Well, we tried it with alcohol, right, with pro prohibition. That didn't work very well. So if there is a way that one could actually close down access to really dangerous drugs like methamphetamine or heroin, maybe that would be a good thing. But I just don't think we're capable of it. Now, maybe you could do that with cigarettes, but again, well, in Canada, for example, you get your cigarettes from the, uh, native reservations because, you know, Canadian law doesn't extend to those reservations, so and they're cheaper and they're not taxed and so forth. It's just all these different channels for people getting what they want. So, better to deal with the 10% who really have problems with substances than try to ban these substances entirely and end up with hundreds of thousands of people in jail. There was a, a man behind you, that's right, who's had his hand up for a while. And um, we're, if we're going to finish on time, it might have to be the last contribution, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and uh, yes, I will come to the balcony next if we've got time, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we have a few minutes. Not too many. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, Welcome. I thought it was really interesting towards the end when you mentioned motivation. Where are you? Uh, I can't find you. Oh, there oh, you sorry. Are. Hi. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, particularly the, the internal aspect of motivation, um, and it's something that I've, I've struggled with, well, well, especially with, about motivation, about personal motivation, uh -huh. about connecting um, addicts with, with the world and with their sort of their life narrative is a very important part of, of where you see the, the answer being. Yeah. Um, it's something I've actually struggled with, with people, people that I would look at and, and see as lacking motivation who have no sort of addictive problem, but I would see as not really making the best of themselves and as of their lives because they don't have that internal engine. Uh -huh. And always very frustrating because it seems to be the, the one thing that you can't give to someone because yeah. it is so so intrinsic to them as a person. So yeah. I don't know whether it's one of the specific psychological approaches you, you listed on the scales at the end, but if there was something that you would, what, what are your thoughts on on helping people to achieve that? Yeah, well, there's something called motivational interviewing, which is a, a, um, an approach to psychotherapy, talk psychotherapy, uh, that helps people really look for what it is that they're attracted to and helps them kind of clear the air and put things in perspective in terms of what their goals are. Um, so maybe that's part of the answer. I, I think there are societal blocks uh, and constraints on what people are capable of achieving. As, as I said before, when you have like oppressed sectors of the population and so forth, they maybe have good reason to be lacking motivation because they're not going to get a good job and they're not going to, you know, uh, whatever, um, they're not going to be able to accumulate wealth or property, whatever it is they're after. So sometimes there's a reason for people to be lacking motivation. But when those factors are not important, are not, are not uh, dominant, then, um, yeah, you know, it's a hard problem. I mean, I, I agree, it's a hard problem. How do you help somebody find something which is intrinsically only available for them to find? So, the balcony person, sorry. Yes, you want to go? <laughs> um, thank you very much, Mark. Ooh, really okay. loud. Um, I'm a member of a, a loved one who's an addict. How would you say, from the unique perspective of someone who's an addict, how best to support them without enabling their activities? And do you see any hereditary um, aspects to addiction? Um, the hereditary parts I think I already spoke about, that there are different personality constellations. Where are you, by the way? I couldn't find you. Oh, you're way up there. No wonder I couldn't find you. Uh, 
So there are different personality characteristics that predispose toward addiction to some degree, 5, 10, 15 percent each, whatever it is. <clears throat> but it doesn't matter how you get there. If you, get, if you become, if you have a serious addiction problem, yes, of course, it's very difficult. What addicts need is inclusion, connection, love, acceptance, um, and, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, but it's really hard sometimes to love an addict. It's hard to know how to give them support and acceptance when in fact they're not only wrecking their own life, but wrecking yours as well, perhaps the lives of their children. And, you know, it's their, they can be pretty unpleasant people. So I think people have to find a balance between firmness and uh, making, defining their own limits and clarifying what those limits are and being able to accept the other person without rejecting them entirely. So you can say, look, I don't want to see you when you're smashed. I don't want to be around you when you're drunk. But tomorrow, when you're not drunk anymore, come on over for lunch or whatever it is. Or we could have a talk. Or if you don't want to get drunk tonight, you know, you could come for a visit. We could watch a movie together or we can go out. Um, so there's ways in which you can sort of, I guess, uh, um, you know, disseminate your regard for that person and your uh, capacity to approve of them and connect with them without having to be in their presence when they are actually uh, harming you, causing you distress. I, 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 should, I should mention the, uh, the rat park studies. Uh, uh, the, uh, very, very briefly, we were talking about other animals and so forth, and what, what a number of researchers found some very, very uh, counter, well, perhaps counterintuitive results um, in the 80s and 90s, they found that they gave rats morphine, a choice between morphine and water, regular water, and rats that were in the normal steel cages, one rat to a cage, would prefer the morphine to the water, like your monkeys. And rat park was they took these animals out of their isolated cages, put them in a large wooden enclosure where they could interact with other rats and socialize and have fun together, and they had toys to play with, rat toys, and guess what? They stopped preferring morphine. They started preferring water. And even those who were physically addicted to the morphine would spontaneously stop taking it, even though they had to suffer withdrawal symptoms, because they preferred the socialization to the, uh, to the morphine. And I think that's one way of trying to highlight the fact that addicts really do need to be connected with other people. We don't want to isolate them completely, because that just makes it worse. Should we take one more contribution? I saw you, this man down here, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry if this is too sociological or maybe philosophical, but I was wanting to get your thoughts on just what is the distinction between behaviour uh, which is addictive and other very similar learning behaviour. And I'm thinking of a kind of you know, toy example where you have two people, both that watch, let's say, a lot of pornography, one of which feels really bad about it, and suffers a great deal and feels they're addicted. And the other one who's not bothered, who, who watches the same amount and enjoys it and feels like that's just part of living in the modern world now. Mm -hmm. Is one of them addicted and the other not? Well, I don't know. I mean, if you feel bad enough about it, you probably stop doing it. <laughs> so uh, it's usually the ones who are feeling... I don't think either of those things is essentially part of the addictive pattern. Uh, you can feel very bad about something you do a lot of, or you can feel very good about something you do a lot of, and conversely, you know, so... Excuse me, I'm yeah. addicted to the Jubilee line. <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> Try to take it easy, though. <laughs> okay, so that, that's what I think. I think those are maybe interacting emotional dynamics. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, so thank you very much then, Mark. Thank it was, you. That was a fantastic Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.